Greetings, everybody, for another uh, session of Practice Perspectives uh, here at the Bob Barkley Study Club. I'm Dr. Paul Henney, and I have uh, Stan Kingma with me again, uh, my colleague of uh, many years who's helped me with a lot of things, and a special guest today, Tom Colquitt of uh, Shreveport, Louisiana, who uh, has been practicing dentistry for, I think, around 53 or so years, started in 1970. Uh, I believe he went to uh, Baylor, uh, and uh, his fa I believe he took over your father's practice. You can elaborate on this a little bit as when I give you the mic here, um, Tom. But um, about n in the 1990s, Tom became more interested in the the topic of obstructive uh, breathing disorders, and really over the last 10 years has become much more intensely involved with that particularly even in his own personal journey. Uh, and he's really focused his practice now on what he would call airway-centered dentistry. So it's a very comprehensive, holistic point of view um, as he approaches each patient. So uh, this is a huge paradigm shift for all of us in dentistry, uh, thinking about a lot of the things that we used to perceive as being genetically driven now we're we're thinking of a lot of these things as being epigenetic and uh, the development or lack of development of the mid face is really being driven by function or dysfunction of a lot of the facial muscles which is influenced by how well a person can or cannot breathe so um, this has changed tom's philosophy uh, and i'm I'm pulling this off of uh, some fantastic presentations that he has on YouTube that I would highly recommend uh, that people visit. And you said, Tom, the big change in our practice philosophy is related to our learning the truth and therefore our protocols when someone seeks our care. The essential truth is unless our patients are able to breathe functionally from their noses to their diaphragm and back through their nose, they will not be able to achieve optimal oral health or optimal bodily health as they are all interrelated. And uh, this has become your passion because you had a, a lot of issues with it as well. And so we're gonna, this is gonna be part of our conversation today is exploring that. And we may even have to set up another um, date to do that. The other thing that's fascinating to me about Tom and Tom's story is that his connection to Dr. Pankey uh, through both personally and through his father, because there's a long legacy of, of uh, very high-level dentistry with Tom. Tom is a uh, former president of the Restorative Academy and uh, just has functioned at the highest levels of dentistry for decades upon decades. So Tom is a bit of a time capsule. He can, he can uh, share with us. He sh can share with us personal experiences related to Dr. Pankey as well as Dr. Barkley. And of course, Dr. Barkley is one of my uh, passions in terms of understanding what he did and the influence I think he still has on dentistry today. And I see, personally, I see Bob Barkley's influence all over Tom's work today. That, would I, that little philosophy statement I just read, I hear Barkley throughout that. That holistic perspective is through and through in Tom's um, mindset today. So without talking too much more about that, let me open it up to Tom and let uh, him tell us a little bit more about himself. Tom? Uh, well, where to start? Uh, well, I've, I have really been blessed in my life in that my father sent me to dental school and set me up in practice. And so I was able to enter a practice with a res, res, uh, preventively oriented restorative dentist, endodontist, periodontist, who was totally ethical and was a, a disruptor and a leader in the profession. And yet I had no debt. So I never had to think about how much money do I have to make. And <clears throat> my father and Harold Worth were uh, two of Dr. Pankey's first students. And when they started the Banky Institute, they wanted daddy to come be part of the core faculty. But I had just graduated from dental school and he was 67 at the time and he just didn't really want to move to, to Florida. Uh, 
my father studied with Panky uh, and with Arvin Mann and used the Panky Mann um, uh, Schuyler, what, what was it called? PMS technique yeah. to restore multiple dentitions with gold, uh, pin ledges in the interior, gold castings in the back, partial coverage, absolutely gorgeous, beautiful work. And an example of the, the longevity of his gold work my mother died at age 96 with 16 units of gold. My father did between 1939 and 1942, including a four unit fixed partial denture out of gold. Mm -hmm. And all of it pretty much looked like when he put it in. Wow. Uh, which makes us really bemoan is this shift towards white stuff actually progress in terms of what does the patient need and what's, what's going to have longevity and what's going to really work. So, you know, I went into a, a, a practice with a mindset where one of the great advantages was he was able to say, here's a thousand mistakes not to make. So <laughs> that really helped a lot. You know, at the time, there were a lot of, a lot of, uh, of course, it was all men in dentistry back then. You'd be a gold man or this kind of man. Now it's uh, totally changed. But, um, uh, where's it? I hate it when that train of thought just runs off the, the rails like that. Did you know Bob Barkley at the time? Yes, I, I, I want to get to that. So my father had, <clears throat> in addition to uh, introducing elastic impression material to the dental community, which was the first time a lab technician could actually make a crown indirectly. And I've got a copy of the lecture he gave in, to the Restorative Academy. It said, now, you may have to pay the lab technician a dollar to make this crown, <laughs> but don't let that stand in the way of this. I think this is the coming thing. Wow. And he also was promoting conservative periodontics, largely due to what he learned from C.C. Bass and Sumter Arnhem, and was a, a real valedict uh, leader in legitimizing endodontics. He wrote many articles, some in the JPD, and one of them starts out, endodontics, long the whipping boy of dentistry and medicine, is here to stay. And he was doing endo when it was considered a crime, and he had to make the patients promise not to tell anybody they were doing it. Wow. So that, that was his mindset. If anything came along that made more sense to him than what he thought he'd been taught, he would embrace it with an open mind. Uh, mm -hmm. None of, I think, the big problem we have in our, our current conflict with medicine is what AA calls contempt before investigation, is, is that a lot of people, because of what they think they know at the top of their silo, they reject anything they hear because it, it, it goes against, the, it, it shows their ignorance in that field and their ego, <laughs> their ego keeps them from exploring it to see if yeah. it makes sense. And my mind has gotten to the point where now the weirdest thing I hear, the more I want to see it is could that possibly be true? Right. Because because when I grew my own airway with homeo blocks, uh, everybody told me it couldn't be done, that you couldn't couldn't grow uh, cranial bones on an octogenarian when in fact it can be done. So Daddy had way before Bob Barkley. Uh, studied with Sumter Arnhem and C.C. Bass. And, it, you know, back then you had to take Dr. Bass's course to be able to buy the right kind toothbrush and dental floss, which is now Butler, unwaxed floss. And so he was already doing that when he first heard Bob Barkley. Uh, and he, before the control program, Daddy called it putting the patient on probation. He'd bring them in, show them how to take care of themselves, give them two weeks to see if they'd do it. And if they would do it, he would take them as patients. And, wow. in court, and so he said, well, you need to go hear this guy, Bob Barkley. So right out of dental school, I went to hear him. And I had been practicing long enough. You know, I went to Baylor, which at the time was a wonderful dental school. Uh, our clinical uh, education was fantastic, which I found out when I took the state board at Loyola in New Orleans. Uh, and Loyola was going out of business, LSU was coming in. And when I saw the skills we had versus what those guys had, I really appreciated our clinical education. 
but I would be, let's say I've got a patient that got a class five recurrent caries on the facial of a lower second molar. And I'd be in there scraping what they used to call materia alba off the teeth <laughs> to get at the, at the old restoration so I could then take out the old restoration and yet put in a new one for the new infection, but the infection had never stopped. Right. And I thought, what the hell is this? What's wrong? And then Bob Barkley, bam, okay. My, my career has been a series of starting out like this and seeing prevention and the fact that the patient needs to be empowered to take care of themselves was the first big opening. The second big opening was uh, after I had, you know, I didn't have a lot to do <clears throat> starting out in practice. My father said, you know, I'm just holding this together until you're, till you're out, and then it's all yours. Well, it took me five years to catch him in production. And, and he was fixing teeth till he was 86 years old. Wow. <laughs> Which is incredible. So the, what I basically sustained myself with, learning to prep teeth and learning to make restorations, was I did all his lab work for about five years. And that's when I found out how to prepare partial coverage because they wouldn't let us do that in dental school. But I noticed that, that the way the, the crowns looked, they, they fit perfectly, but the anatomy, I, I remember back at dental school, we've got to restore a lower first molar. So I asked the instructor, what should I make the biting surface look like? And he'd say, well, if the teeth around it have wear facets on them, build those same wear facets into your restoration. And I thought, well, why don't we call it a restoration? <laughs> why do we want to restore a tooth that's already worn out? Shouldn't we make that more like a natural tooth? So before it's worn out, so it would function better. Right. And so after making hundreds of castings for my father, you know, with that chew and bite technique, what you really have there on the occlusal surface is the blank for a tooth that is lacking natural anatomy. And so that started bothering me. And that's when I started, I read Pete Dawson's book, started studying occlusion, uh, started taking pure anthological waxing courses. And that's when it went from fixing a tooth at a time to beginning to understand the somatonathic system, although nobody was talking about breathing. Nobody was really talking about chewing and swallowing. Nobody was talking about the tongue. We were talking about the joints, the muscles, the teeth, how the anatomy of the teeth had to be subservient to the, to the movement of the jaws. And I started doing my own lab work. And I, I really had thought my hands weren't very good until I learned why teeth had to be shaped like that. Then all of a sudden I could make restorations that look like teeth because I had in my mind, or this is where these cusps have to be. This is where these ridges have to run. These are where the co the contacts need to be. These are the escape pathways. So for, I don't know, 15, 20 years, I was pretty much a pure nathologist, uh, doing a lot of occlusal adjustments, mounting casts, treating TMD. But then the big eye opening was in the 1990s. All right, why are we restoring these worn out mouths? Why are these mouths worn out? Oh, they can't breathe. And I had become interested when I wrote the Red Pete's book on occlusion. Uh, I started figuring out my own occlusion and I had a, a wear facet on a cuspid. And I thought, how could I have that? I'd have to be way out here to do that. And I don't go out there. And then I started looking at my patients to see if I could see those patterns. And sure enough, I got to where I could predict what side they slept on by the way their anterior teeth were worn. So I published an article in the JPD in 1985 called the Sleepwear Syndrome, showing our daughter at 12 developing bruxism habits at night uh, and figured out the diagrams of the non-working contacts and the biomechanics of why teeth wore. But what I was totally missing, and we were told, is stress, is stress. And yeah, it's stress, but it isn't the stress from watching the news. I mean, it may be, but it's your endogenous stress from the fact that you're uh, hypoxic so much of the time. Right. You're, you're lead, but we didn't know any of that. So when I began to put all this together in the world of airway, now everything. Now, you reach these stages where you think, 
I mean, my father told me once, I think I know everything there is to know about endodontics. Uh, and he may have at that time. All I'm aware of right now is how much I just don't know. But right. it, it has been such an exciting, I've had to learn more in the last 10 years than in the previous 40 years. And it just really keeps, I'm, I'm an old fart with a congestive heart failure, but this just keeps me, uh, <laughs> uh, it's an obsession. And what's happened is it's gone from being a wonderful profession. And, and, and the interesting thing is I was able to do it during the golden age of dentistry. So I started out with no debt. I didn't have to make money. All I had to care about was if, if, they're, if, you, they're, if you're in the room with a patient, there's only one important person in that room, and that's the patient. And there's only one part of the person in that room whose needs are important, and that's the patient's needs. And so if I was a kid getting out of school today with a half million dollar debt, I don't know if I'd be able to have that mindset. I'd be looking for, does that caries really need fixing? Or I'd be selling smiles. And that's yeah. what we've got now in industry is we're selling smiles. But in terms of, you know, open a, open a yellow pages in your city and look at dentistry and see if you can find the word health in there anywhere. Right. The word is smile. Yeah. And smile is very, very important to people. It's obvious people will pay, they'll spend a billion dollars on cosmetics, but you know, they won't get a minor hangnail fix because they don't care how it looks. Everybody wants to spend money on cosmetics. So I understand the importance of that. But in the importance of understanding, really understanding a patient and their physiologic, dental, uh, holistic needs, the least important thing in there is the smile. Uh, and I hate to say this, but I gave a table clinic on this <laughs> in Chicago about eight years ago. And Pete Dawson and Bill McCars were my last audience. And I said, and you may want to take this out. I said, you know, <laughs> the least important thing in the mouth is the smile. The smile is just the icing on the cake. And if the cake is made out of dog shit, what good is it? <laughs> so that may be a, yeah, I, I tend towards profanity. Yeah. But, uh, well, so, on that on that point, I mean, the smile is obviously an emotional uh, moment for a person, and it's a, certainly a motivating uh, element in, in a personality. But it's it it represents an opportunity, really, for us if we can connect the dots between why their smile isn't optimal now then you can link what they're seeing to a deeper understanding, which is essentially what you're doing right now. You've taken it to the next level. You've extended the conversation to say, hey, the appearance of your smile is actually related to the health of your somatonathic system and everything else. And that's the reason your smile isn't optimal is because of maybe some growth and development deficiencies or uh, excessive destruction because you're grinding your teeth at night because you can't breathe properly, all kinds of things. So really, in my mind anyways, the, the smile presents an opportunity for some excellent leadership if you know how to do it, if you know how to engage the person on more than just a superficial level and, sh and sell them shiny objects for the best price in town uh, and get them to, to visualize something that's more important than that future focus to the point that they're visualizing their health and appearance 10, 20, 30 years or more from now, because if they don't address these core problems, then their smile is never going to look good. It doesn't matter what we do to it today. So, I mean, I think yeah. these things are very related, but the easy sell, just like anything else, is to just uh, use heuristics and manipulate people emotionally, which is being done. And um, you know, that's a big part of why uh, the, all this this all on four tragedy, I think, is going across the country right now is people are saying, well, I, you know, it's basically just another iteration of a smile, smile in a day. Right. So it's the whole everything. We're just we're just going to rip everything out and and put optimal looking teeth in there. But they're not teeth. We're going to put optimal looking fake teeth in there. And we're not even going to work with you. We're not going to put them through the test that your father did. 
we're not going to put you on probation. We're not going to even make you stop smoking. We're just going to slam it in there and see um, how many of these cases we can do in a month. You know, that's our goal. That's our goal. Health, there is no, as you said, there is no mention of the word health in any of this process. So, uh, you know, that that's what bothers me, Tom. Well, two of the, the number four is part of our curse today. The first is the extraction of four premolars. Uh, which in my view should be a crime. Uh, you can't really blame them for what they did. That's what they were taught to do, but there's no science behind it. And there's all kinds of evidence to show that at least not only are they ugly with a big nose and no mid, mid face, they're going to have breathing problems. If they're women, they're going to have TMD problems. Uh, and frequently the only way you can restore them to health is to open those spaces back up and put implants in there. So that's the four problem with that. Uh, although, you know, we think back to Prozac and those who knew that all you had to do was grow the arches and the teeth, make the living room and the furniture will fit. <laughs> if the furniture doesn't fit, there's something wrong with the living room. There's nothing wrong with the furniture. The other thing with, with the all on four is why are these people in such terrible shape? They've never been taught to take care of themselves. They don't have any idea about oral maintenance of oral health. So if you take out all their teeth and you haven't done that, what's the health around those implants going to be like? And then secondly, to put in an all on four, you basically got to take both arches and grind them down a centimeter to make room for the crap you're going to put in there. And if that fails, then you're permanently screwed to eternity. Essentially, yeah. And that's kind <laughs> of, uh, that's that's the end stage of that whole process, which unfortunately on my on my own accord i've had to learn the hard way i've had some all on four cases that that we did 15 17 years ago and the patient disappeared you know they never returned for the follow-ups well they, they've come back uh you know 10 12 years later and implants are failing and we got very few options left on the table because yeah. of that and we you know we don't think about that on the front end we think this is new and exciting and wow how wonderful it is uh, but we don't factor in the human, the human nature into, into this whole equation. Well, so, behavior. Yeah. You know, if, if we if we get into the crux of, here's what I tell every new patient in, in my airway practice. This is about three things. It's about your tongue, your nose, and your diaphragm, and about how you're going to be able to breathe through your nose 24 hours a day, including when you're asleep. And our approach involves two things, patient education and behavior modification. And behavior modification is probably the most important of any of these in anything we're looking at in dentistry. I've discovered so many patients that I help, I get them where they can breathe through their nose, but they're still breathing. If, if you put your fist at, at the crux of your diaphragm and breathe in and out through your nose, your, your fist should rise which shows that you're breathing diaphragmatically and you're using 100% of your lung volume. But I'll see a lot of people, they're doing better, but when they do that, their chest is rising because they're still intercostal breathers. So mm -hmm. we've opened their airway, but they're still not, their breathing behavior still isn't right. So we have to really work on that with toning exercises and getting them to work to strengthen the diaphragm and strengthen the, small, the smooth muscles of their airway I mean, what causes collapse is Bernoulli's law and Poiseuille's law. If you've got a small chamber and you're moving a lot through it, it's going to want to suck the sides together. If you slow down the flow by getting them to breathe six times a minute or less, and then you strengthen the muscles in that airway, everybody talks about building a bigger airway. You don't need a bigger airway. You can work with the one you have and breathe correctly through it. And it all comes back to behavior modification and what the patient does. And so we're back, we're really looping back to an epigenetic uh, situation. You know, the, the, we can influence how the body's responding to this situation by, by training people or helping people to develop new behaviors that stimulate different muscle responses and hence uh, more open airways. Well, what would really be interesting to see genealogically over a period of generations, 
I think what we've seen now in epigenetics is that, I mean, I've got a, uh, last year I had to treat a family of seven, including all the kids, and they were all biretronathic mouth breathers. Now, that can't all be epigenetics. I mean, that's, that's some genetic influence. Right. However, the basic idea about how, you know, the human face is flattened faster than any change in evolution ever. Uh, and we could talk for another couple of hours the reasons for why that's happened. It's our fault. Uh, what we've done is uh, we've abandoned Mother Nature's prescription for growth and development to suit our convenience. And as such, we are breeding ourselves to extinction. I mean, that's the way I put it. And, and so you could have families who, going back to the Mayflower, had uh, good, good physiognomy, big cheekbones, big airways, and yet their children weren't breastfed, and their children were raised on pablum, and their craniofacial respiratory complex is never developed, and epigenetically it changed the expression of their DNA and passed it on to the next generation. And that's, I think, why we're seeing this happen so fast and so geometrically to the point where it's the number one public health problem in all developed countries. Right. What would be interesting to see is if we can take adults uh, who have these characteristics and ch help them change themselves, interesting to see if if they pass that characteristic on or whether it improves the genome. Right. I mean, we'll all be dead and nobody will ever look yes. at it, but that would be interesting yeah. to know. Uh, you know, I, the way I kind of think about it is we live in a very toxic culture uh, oh, from... Right from whether it's the air that we're breathing, the food that we're eating, the crap that we're taking in on television or whatever, or reading or, or not reading. Uh, we, li we, live in a, we live in a culture that is very destructive. It's not in harmony with the way we were designed. Including, we're food, including food our bodies can't identify exactly, as food. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, and Barclay was big on that, Yeah, too. absolutely. I mean, these are not new realizations at all. <laughs> But, you know, so that that's just a that right there, just getting somebody to a place where they can have that kind of level of understanding of that they're they're living in a toxic environment, whether uh, whether it's even, you know, how they're being advised to raise their children or all, right on down the line that from the psychology of our culture to to everything. So it the only way out of that is self-agency. Right. I mean, we, can, we cannot get people to make the kinds of changes that you're helping people with until you can connect with them on a deeper level that you create within that person the motivation to take pay all these prices, time, energy, money, inconvenience. To, and, th and that's only possible if they've got a vision in mind of what it is they're trying to achieve. And, and so that's, the, that's the reason my good friend Dave McCarty, who was the – he brought me into the – uh, sleep department at LSU Medical. <laughs> it's an interesting story. <clears throat> My physician had retired, and I, I went, somebody said, go see Dave McCarty. He's really good. Uh, young man. So I went to see him, and <laughs> while he had his thumb against my prostate gland <laughs> at the exam, he said, in, I, in truth in advertising, I got to tell you, I'm, I'll do this exam but I'm quitting private practice. I'm going into sleep medicine at LSU. And I said, well, can I come with you? And so when he went over there, he brought me on to the faculty and I went to, I was in the sleep department at LSU for about 10 years, went to grand rounds and presented to them. And he had then retired. He then moved to Colorado to practice airway, uh, to uh, practice sleep medicine. And he became so infuriated by the way sleep physicians treat their patients that he has retired and written a book called empowered sleep apnea and the whole point of it is called a handbook for patients with apnea and those who care for them and it explains what the whole idea is to give a sense of agency to the patient so if they really or here's a classic example I've got two friends who just came to me yesterday as patients, uh, a married couple. They just had sleep studies. He's got an AHI of 35 or worse. She's wow. 15. 
So they, they both got mild to, I mean, moderate to severe sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. They had their sleep study. They were given CPAPs. They were sent home with CPAPs. They never met a sleep doctor. Nobody has talked to them. They just, so now they've got this toaster oven in a box that they have no idea what to do with. And one of Dave's scenes in, in the book is there, there are two patients crawling across this desert with toaster ovens strapped to their back, looking for somebody to tell them how to use this damn machine on their back. Yeah. Some of whom really didn't even have sleep apnea. They had hypersomnolence or they had uh, or narcolepsy that could have been treated with medicine because nobody at the front end got to know that patient, did co-discovery with them, managed those patients, coached them, walked them through it. And he was able to get, I mean, uh, I would say nationally, the number of people who are aware of CPAP seven hours a night is probably 20% of yeah, what they get. Yeah. He was able to get about 95% uh, compliance with his patients because he spent so much time with them. Right. And the big dis difference is it's not about money. It's not about the seven minute appointment. It's about getting to know your patient. And it, 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 we were talking yesterday, he says, it's as if they're trapped in a cave in the dark and they don't know how to move around in that cave. And they've got this CPAP under their arm and you come in with a light and you show them what's going on in that cave. And you educate them so they can find their own way how to get out of that cave. That's a, it's all the same thing. Yeah, that's a it's a powerful metaphor. Um, yeah, I mean, when you don't know the patient well and you haven't done enough work to really make a full diagnosis, then the only thing that you can do is you know treat the patient reductionistically, which is essentially just throwing spaghetti against the wall. And whether it's a medication or a oral appliance or a sleep apnea machine, it doesn't matter. That that's my experience with the vast majority of people come into my practice. That's the way they've been managed so far. I just talked to one this week who was uh, diagnosed with moderate sleep apnea, and she had a, a CPAP machine, but she wasn't. She was intolerant, completely not using it. She was a disaster. I, she, I, I always see my patients first in a consult room. Me too. By the time I came into the room, she literally had drifted off to sleep because she, yeah. she, her sleep quality was so poor. Yeah. And she had the, everything, restricted arch. She had a, uh, she had a tongue tie. She, she, you know, dark, darkness under her eyes, you know, checked every box. Um, and the only way she'd been treated in the past was thrown asleep. Uh, CPAP machine was thrown at her that she didn't really understand and didn't like to use, and there was n no follow-up. Then the company that uh, did the diagnosis and prescribed that for her went b went bankrupt because they got run out of town by the the bigger player in town, <laughs> which you can't which you can't get in for an appointment for an overnight sleep study for like eight months. So that that's the level that we're dealing with right now. It's it's quite a crisis. Well, and as Dave points out, and this is the reason he's uh, he's going with the AAPMD now. He's crossed over to dentistry. He has, uh, is in his book, he quotes me and, and my father's experience and talks about airway-centered dentistry. Um, what was I saying? saying? Uh, senility is not pretty, boys. <laughs> <laughs> it's really not. Uh, what were you just talking about? What did I, I lost that train of thought. I was just talking about the patient that I, that oh. I saw that. Yeah. Um, let's just move on. I just had a brain fart. Okay. All right. Let me, let, <laughs> All right. let me let, <laughs> let, me let Stan, 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 by the way, is not a dentist. That's his biggest strength. He hasn't, <laughs> he, he, it, it hasn't, he hasn't been so educated that he, that he's clueless uh he's actually an engineer so he has a very objective point of view towards a lot of things and he's been involved in a lot of creative things including music so he has a is a very and we've worked for a long time so he understands dentistry so stan always has some great questions let me let me let you so do stan, that stan what, what, what's your musical addiction 
Well, I'm addicted to music uh, as an occupation. I made my living in music directing a collegiate choral musical ensemble for oh, really? uh, almost 15 years. And then I left that because of the infrastructure I had to deal with at a university. And then I've been a freelance musician uh, doing uh, civic groups and large choruses and large musical ensembles. And that in addition to running an ad agency. And um, so, yeah, it's been an interesting life. But my question is, you said back in uh, several minutes ago, the young people coming out with $100,000, $200,000 indebtedness uh, really don't have the mindset to say, how can I put my patient first? How can, how can I even start to be interested in this? I can't afford it. Give them some advice. There are some people watching this right now that are deeply in debt. They, they, they've watched your YouTube uh, videos, uh, which I did as well last night. And they say, oh, boy, this sounds like this is central to what I want to do. How are they going to get involved in that? Give them some advice. Boy, that's a tough one. That's really a tough one. You're, you, I mean, you're talking about throwing spaghetti against the wall. I know some dentists who make 50 or so appliances a month. And so they're making a killing. <laughs> they're making a whole lot of money. But, you know, how much attention uh, do the patients actually get there? And what we're doing, my protocol, uh, how do I monetize it? Well, I'm unique because I've got Medicare and Social Security. And that's the time I really got into this. Uh, I'm a, uh, uh, got a terrible medical history. My wife's a cancer survivor. Our uh, medical insurance bill was, was $5,000 a month up to the time I was 65. <clears throat> and so when I got Medicare and Social Security, we have no debt. So I don't have to make money. So my goal has been to try to figure out a practice protocol and algorithm. We call it the walk to wellness. That instead of bundling everything together and not, you know, if you've got a letter of medical necessity and you're making an appliance for a patient, you've got to get them completely treated in 90 minutes, in 90 days. Well, we're talking about lifetime dysfunctions of the entire body that have been going anywhere from 15 to 50 years, we're not going to correct that in 90 days. It takes a while. It's slow. And so I how, are you, how, are you, how are you going to monetize that? Well, that's uh, what I'm getting at. It, it, and we just take it a step at a time to try this, see, see if, if just educating them, taping their mouth, sleeping on their side, see if that helps. If not, do they need an oral appliance? If that won't do it, do they maybe need a tongue release and myofunctional therapy? Or do they, maybe they need expansion. So that goes over a long period of time and I don't charge people a lot for it. I'm just trying to figure out how to do it. Now I've, I've got a couple of young female dentists who are really into this, uh, but one of them's in the Air Force, so, but she is trying to figure out now, she already, one year out of dental school, knows more about this than 90% of the people on any airway blog you can find. And she says, I am going to figure out during my time in the Air Force how to be able to do this in an integrative practice with a team and actually make money doing this. Good but for her. It's not going to happen until several things happen. First is the impossible. You know, insurance companies are really only interested in their, their profit for this quarter. If they could look at, if you could take 5,000 kids with breathing problems and correct them by the time they're seven years old, that might save hundreds of millions of dollars in insurance costs throughout the life of those kids. And you would think insurance could look at that and realize that orthodontics for two years for a kid is cheaper than a heart transplant after having them on expensive medications their whole life. So we got to pray that somehow that there is a bean counter who says, hey, when they say an ounce of prevention, maybe this could save us a whole lot of money. 
The next thing is that's got to happen before this is possible is that every freshman dental student in gross anatomy and in physiology needs to really understand the airway while they're looking at it. They need to be taught all of this from day one in dental school. Well, I was on a board of trustees at Baylor and I came up with the idea the only way to change institutions is with nuclear devices. But because <laughs> I tried to make some changes there and it was not well received. But that's got to change in the curriculum. And the other thing that's got to change is every first year orthodontic student needs to understand growth and development. The Enlo and Han book on the growth of the face was the, and the first sentence in there is that the airway is the keystone for the development of the face. It was required reading for every orthodontic resident. It's been out of print for 20 years. Yeah. I had to pay $200 for a, for a soft copy of it. I, they need to look at that book the day they get there, yeah. and they need to be taught the errors of what Bill Hang calls ERRS, extraction and retraction, regret syndrome. They need to be taught what Crozat and those people knew is that we, we need to develop these kids. We don't need to restrict them right. because look at all the pathology that happens. So if dental students know this, so that when they get out, their hygienists can be the sentinels. Because, it's, oh, this is where I was going to say about Dave. Dave says in his book, there's one sleep physician for every 40,000 Americans. Now, how the hell are they going to be able to deal with that? And, you know, the, who, who with apnea or UARS is likely to even end up with a sleep physician? But they're very likely to end up in a dental chair. Right. And if hygienists and dentists know this, they're the sentinels. So if we can yeah. educate the next generation of dentists, uh, and if we can educate the next generation of orthodontists, and if we can do, if you think about 20 years ago, big pharma, I'm a doctor, and the door opens, and this sexy-looking girl with cleavage and high heels comes in with a box of Omaha steaks, and she gives them to me because she wants me to prescribe their medicine. And so, or, or she gives me a trip to the Bahamas or something like that. And, and Big Pharma said, screw that. Let's educate, let's, let's, let's advertise directly to the public. So you can't watch TV 10 minutes without 10 drug ads. Right. So the idea being, if you create the demand in the public, medicine will have to accede to it. They'll have to meet the demand. So what we've got to do in social media is going to be the answer. And I think, I really think James Nestor has done an awful lot to advance this cause is to educate the public. Right. If we educate the public, if we can reach out to every mother, grandmother and wife in this country, because they're the ones who notice and make decisions and make people yeah. go do what they yeah. don't want to do, then that, it's going to take all that to happen. And I'll be long dead before we see it. Right. But that is a, that is a macro solution, and there are got to be some micro solutions. Paul, you're you're you have been amazingly successful at spending more and more time with your patients, and you've been profitable doing that. It seems to me like uh, there has to be a, a micro something that a young dentist can do right now. Expand well, on that a little bit. Here's my Either idea. One of you. Here's my idea, and here's what I think all dentists should do. Uh, about 30 years ago, I was talking to my friend who was my attorney. <clears throat> and he said, if you call me on Thursday night with a legal problem, and I wake up Friday morning and I start thinking about it while I move my bowels, take a shower and shave and drive to work, when I get to work, you get a bill because that was billable hours when I was dealing with your, with your problem. CPAs, attorneys have no problem charging hundreds of dollars just for their time. Now, what we've gone from and what we're doing now is if I spend probably four hours on my computer for every hour I spend with that patient doing the detective game of figuring out what's going on. I keep all of my records on PowerPoint. So everything's visual. That way I don't have to remember anything. 
and it takes a long time to put together those records. What we just need to do is to say, and I think uh, Susan Maples does this already. Uh, she says, I don't take insurance. This is fee for service. And we just need to grow the cojones as dentists to use billable hours to charge for our time. Now, my friend Jack Swepston, who uh, taught us in dental school, he was a hardcore nophologist. When he got the, got the patient's cast mounted and was getting ready to go do his diagnostic work in the lab with diagnostic equilibrations and wax up, he'd say, now your next appointment is your laboratory appointment and you're welcome to be there because I'm going to charge you for it. So yeah. he would charge it, and this is 50 years ago, he would charge them for his time in figuring out what they needed. And, you know, what's really valuable, what we actually do to them or how we figure out what they need. So the way you can actually make a living in it now is let the patient know insurance may not cover this, but if you're on board with this, this may change the entire yeah. trajectory of your life. What's right. that worth to you? Yeah, and uh, I've got Paul, to charge you Paul, for my time. Right. Yeah, and that, dial in on this, Paul. Yeah, I mean that's the conversation that I have with this uh, this gal on Wednesday was was exactly that. I'm not, I don't take insurance either, um, and I think you know the as long as you you follow the dysfunctional codependency relationship with the insurance industry, there is no way out of this doom loop. If you the best way I think to find uh, the pathway to being independent and, and basically that's the pathway that you've described for us today, Tom, was that you had the independence to do the right thing at every turn. Cause you didn't have debt and you had your, f f all the support from your dad and all the, this, this uh, cocoon of tremendous knowledge and support <laughs> and development. You know, most of us don't have that. And, um, You've got to learn how to connect with people in more effective ways. I mean, that's why I'm so obsessed, really, with Bob Barkley's work, because he taught us, showed us how to do that. It's only when you get to a place where you can have these open, honest conversations with people that are, that are grounded in trust and honesty and integrity that you can move the ball into this realm that you've been sharing with us over the last 45 minutes, Tom. They're not going to listen to you. You know, you have, as Bob Barkley used to say, you need to earn the right to be heard. Okay. That's not going to happen in a hygiene room uh, in five minutes' time after you met a new patient. Forget, no. forget about it. That's transactional dentistry. That's going to lead to nothing but reductionistic care. And it's going to cause you to, to miss all kinds of diagnoses as well as opportunities to connect with the person on a deeper level and become a more effective leader. And that's the, at the end of the day, that's the bottom line. How effective is your leadership? If you don't have a clarity in your mind, the way Tom does about what it is he's trying to achieve with each person, then how can you possibly lead them there? You know, mm -hmm. you, you can't. So, so that requires self-development. That requires writing a philosophy statement, which I, I read you, Tom's, at the, at the beginning of this. He put it right out there in the public. And it's got to be not that you have to sit down and read that to every patient, but they have to feel that and experience that. And so you've got to get clear yourself. You've got to develop yourself. You've got to refine your communication skills. You've got to refine your clinical skills. You've got to restructure your practice in a way that you can spend quality time with people. So the opportunity is there to connect with the ones that are likely to say yes. Yeah. You can, yeah. You, you can spin your wheels talking to people that have no interest whatsoever in what you can do for them. So you've got to be wise about how you use your time. And well, and pat patient selection is very important. Yeah. Uh, maybe 30 years ago when I was really doing blowing and going, doing full mouth reconstructions, I had a rich. <clears throat> lawyer from a small town come in and his mouth was destroyed. He needed a complete reconstruction. And he probably needed, at the time, $40,000 well, $40, or so worth of work, which, you know, for a young dentist with kids in college, that was going to be a good thing to do. And I talked to him for about an hour, and he looked out the window the whole time I was talking to him. Right. And I said, well, I would need another appointment with you to gather records to know what you need, but I would 
guess you need your mouth completely restored after you need to learn to take care of yourself. And it's going to be forty or fifty thousand dollars. And I hope you can find somebody who will do that for you because I can't help you. <laughs> patient selection is really important. Yeah. And the patient has to be on board. If they're not committed to what you're doing with what we're trying to do, right. it's a waste of time. Right. So it's a matter of alignment of philosophy. And you you mentioned that your father was doing that. They had yeah. they were they were they're in this 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 period of two weeks where they had to really show their willingness to be to, to commit themselves to that. That's exactly what you were just saying there. Bob Barkley did the same thing. He he met with all of his patients on Wednesday evenings who were interested in joining the practice, and they would just sit down and have a cup of coffee, and they basically would talk about the unique nature of the philosophy of his practice. And if that wasn't their cup of tea, so be it. Let's let's choose not to work together instead of fighting against each other when we've got conflicting values and priorities. I mean, everybody has a right to live in dishealth. They have a light, right to live however they want to live. But it's not, and this is a hard realization for me, it's not my job to change other people. The best I can do is maybe reveal within them things that they want but they they don't have the sophistication yet to understand that and that's all that's all leadership stuff right and so you know that's where we need to work on ourselves uh and brian vince is a great example of that of how he's developed himself to the point where his communication skills and his systems are functioning at such a high level that he can he can get that stuff to bubble to the surface of the patients that come to him and as because of that he's be, been able to refine his technical skills to a super high level and be respected as one of the best dentists in the world you know yeah, brian, brian is a good friend and a real piece of work yeah yeah he, he's not afraid to tell you what he thinks just like no, no, <laughs> no he's not <laughs> you know i just thought of something funny in retrospect about tongue ties you remember tom brokaw yeah, I have trouble saying L's and R's. Barkley had a had a restricted tongue. I'm just thinking back to the way he talked. He couldn't say L's or R's. Yeah. So he probably had significant breathing problems undiagnosed himself. Back well, then. he he had problem. I know that he had trouble keeping his weight down. Yeah, that was a big issue for him. Uh, well, leptin so. and ghrelin. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, somehow, somehow, fate has brought together two very profound thinkers looking at a broader picture of health through the mouth and the airway. And I would like to propose, Paul, even without asking you, that we continue this with a couple of additional sessions with Tom, where you guys just help the younger dentists, the people who are totally unaware of this, become aware of it and maybe uh, spark a passion or two. Tom, would you be interested in, in doing another uh, session like this so that, you know, that we you can touch really... more people? This must be supply and demand. I must be at the end of the list. <laughs> <laughs> this, if, if, go I ahead. Mean, that, that's a dumb question. That's like asking the dog who just came in the room if she would like me to throw the tennis ball for her. <laughs> 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 you know, what? there's only so much time left, and there's so much that needs to be seen. And, you know, as I began to progress through this, I mean, I worked with Keith Thornton forever, made tap appliances, showed up to take uh, Mark Cruz's first course about 10 years ago. At the time, I thought I knew an awful lot about all of this. And then began to see uh, how big all this was and and then realized that I, I was the poster boy. I didn't have obstructive sleep apnea, but I was a mouth breather and I had a I almost died multiple times from chronic inflammatory disease. So I could see in myself how big it was. Then as I started looking at patients, I realized this is huge. This is absolutely huge. This is the major problem in this country. It's just diagnosed. The problem we have is that the average doctor's appointment is seven minutes. And if you're lucky, that's with a doctor. It would right. probably be with a, with a nurse practitioner. And during those seven minutes, the only time is, what's your chief complaint? What's your symptom? Okay, I have trouble sleeping. 
all right. And they, what they do is they, they don't say, well, do you also have uh, uh, brain fog? Do you wake up tired? Do you have gastroenteric problems? Do you have reflux? Uh, uh, do you wake up with a headache or a backache? No, they said no. They diagnose the symptom as a disease, and they treat the disease with a medicine. So what they've done is manage the symptom of a disease without ever getting to the upstream cause of what's going on. Right. And then once you realize how every every inflammatory disease, non-infectious inflammatory disease process that we know of is directly related to the inability to breathe, chew, swallow, then you realize this is just absolutely huge. And it's, that's when it became an obsession. And that's why I read about six crime novels a week, just so I don't have to think about this. <laughs> yeah. So, that's well, and I, and I think, and I think dentists are in the, in the catbird seat in terms of being able to establish these relationships and assume the, uh, the primary leadership role in this. Can this is an, there is no difference between medicine and dentistry in treating these patients right, right now. Right. There's no difference. The only difference is we need to be working together instead Absolutely of Absolutely that. Absolutely right. That. And we need and we need to educate. We need to expose this to more people who are in a position to do something about it. And I think that's what's happening here. So congratulations to Paul for creating this relationship with Tom and thank you, Tom, for hey, my, my pleasure. goodness, my goodness, the amount of knowledge that you've given in this uh, last, we are now at 57 minutes in this <laughs> uh, conversation. And, and so obviously we can't go on for uh, another uh, 20 minutes because we're going to uh, exceed the capacity <laughs> of the young you mind to, to take all of this in. So um, would you accept the possibility of doing another one of these so that we sure. can continue this? And sure. Maybe maybe we use some images. I don't know. Sure. sure. I'm getting yeah. ready to start yeah. doing grand rounds for the medical school again, where I'm going to be able to do Zoom broadcasts to all the different residents, including pedo and psychiatry. And, and so I'll probably have some stuff put together that's the right length that we could show. Yeah, well, we fantastic. have to work out the technical side of that. Yeah. But Paul, why don't we? Uh, well, thank you so much. And and I've been taking notes here, and I'm I'm not even in dentistry. And I watched your videos last night on YouTube. Good and, lord, uh, it's <laughs> uh, it's very fascinating and and deeply interesting. I think to the general public, and we need to find a way to get this out. I think to the general public, not just to the dentist, but first of all, through the dental community. So, Paul, uh, that's just my thoughts. So, Paul, why don't you uh, wrap this up and uh, we'll continue this. And I'll bet you're going to get a following for this because there is wisdom coming out of this uh, information. Well, th this has been a, a great session. I really appreciate Tom taking the time to to contribute to it. Um, as I said, I think dentists are in the catbird seat on this, but they have to understand where they are and what, what what the possibilities are, and that requires a lot of self development and understanding and experience and connection with people like Tom and so many others that have let, are really the pioneers in this area in healthcare. You know, this is this is dentistry, but it's beyond dentistry. You know, we're 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 moving the boundaries. We're we're breaking down some of these barriers, and I think that we've all got to get knowledgeable enough that we can get comfortable operating in this space and talking to people about it eye to eye, honestly, not in a non-manipulative way, not to just sell them another unit of this or that or keep our production number at the whatever the goal is this month. We got to we got to we, you know, we got to move way past that. And I, and I think my personal experience is if the goal is to take care of your patients as best as you know how, that honesty will will resonate through. You will, to quote Bob Barkley, you have earned the right to be heard. And honestly, the average person wants to take care of themselves better. They just have no idea how to do that. And they've never spent any time with anybody that cared with them enough and that was listening to them carefully enough to, to, to lead them out of the, the, the dark room that Tom was, the metaphor that Tom was using. So 
thanks for hanging with us. This, this is kind of a long session, but I think the content was just uh, solid gold. And we'll find another date to reconnect with Tom and just kind of continue this conversation and dig a little deeper into it. I mean, he's got a whole story about what he did for himself, and uh, which is a very interesting uh, story as well. And then you can see his his uh, the videos that he's produced up on YouTube as well. Tom, do you want to give a email or any contact information for people to get in touch with you? Sure. My email address is T Casale, T C A S O U L E T, T Casale at gmail dot com. I think we need to wrap this up. So, Paul, do you want to do the out? And uh, we'll see you the next time. Absolutely. Again, thanks for everybody for, for dialing in. Um, and if you have any questions or need to contact me, my, my email is right there at the bottom of the screen. And uh, we will catch up with you soon for another Practice Perspectives. Thanks again. Great. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Thank you.